Hello, my name is Michaela O'Connor Abrams, founder of Mocha Plus. Welcome to our Collective Conscience series. We created this series for you to bring together great minds from around the world on myriad topics that we hope will expand your mind, will challenge your current beliefs, and give you an opportunity to be inspired with every video. Enjoy. I'm Shelley Tatum Kieran, partner at Mocha Plus, and welcome to our fifth Zoom salon, our sixth uh, collective conscious salon, but our fifth on Zoom. And we have discovered that this format is perfect because it allows us to invite all kinds of people and with, with a little bit more flexibility and have lots and lots of people come and come back and be able to, to, to enjoy each one of the salons for different reasons, but to learn something new every time. So we're thrilled that, um, that we have you all together again, some returning and some new. And I will turn it over to my partner, Michaela. Thank you so much, Shelley. Well, first and foremost, I should let everybody know that I am broadcasting live from this beautiful French cottage in Pacific Grove. And yes, social distance, yes, isolating in place. This is a place that I have been during this whole time uh, called the, the second home. And uh, it is the home of my friend, Tony Marie Murphy. And when we are open again, um, it's a great place to come and stay. And she puts it on VRBO. So it's really a privilege to be here tonight. And it is an exceptional privilege to be here with our guest tonight, Holly Payne. I have known Holly now just a little over a year and one of our um, collective conscience uh, community, Shonda Ballas, was kind enough to introduce us uh, more through a business purpose for Holly's most recent startup called Booksby. But it has given me the opportunity to get to know Holly at a completely different level. And what's so wonderful about these salons and what we plan for them to be is to take this one hour of your time on Monday night to share an, an incredible diversity of people, both from uh, opinions and industries and geographies and genders and states of mind. Well, tonight, Holly is going to be exploring with me her journey on grit to grace. Now, if you looked at the invitation, you saw the beautiful oyster and the pearl and, of course, emblematic of exactly what we're going to speak of. Um, Holly is, for those of you who might not have Googled her to say, well, I wonder if I'm going and who is Holly Payne anyway? You would have seen that she is an international novelist. She has completed four novels. Um, I would send you also to an article on Forbes that we will send you a link to, if you'd like, um, written by uh, John Greathouse in July of 2019. It gives you a lot more about Holly and Booksby. But tonight, we're going to take this international novelist and uh, explore something far deeper, far more vulnerable, if you're Holly, far more uh, able to really show, whether we're in COVID or not, a path that was anything but easy, and yet she would say that these were the building blocks to grace. So Holly, welcome, and thank you so very much for being here and being willing to go from being this fabulous fiction novelist to a nonfiction status here tonight to talk to us about what it has taken to get you to this place and what does that lens looking inside you really look like? Well, first of all, thank you so much. I, um, it's such an honor to meet with everyone tonight and I am so grateful personally to have these Monday night gatherings. Um, it's really brought a lot of hope and uh, no pun intended because that's what we're actually going to be talking a lot about tonight. Um, it's just a real honor and I'm so grateful for the questions that have come up and the, the participation that everyone has shown. And when Michaela and I talked last week about what we were really going to talk about tonight, I, 
I thought, wow, um, we're all dealing with some pretty challenging things right now. And I wanted to make sure that this hour was going to be valuable to you. And there's so much that we can talk about. And I thought, this is the first time in my life I'm really kind of forging ahead and speaking more from the journalist in me and not having to be a, a CEO or a founder at the moment and talk about technology. But I wanted to talk about probably more, what's more important to us is really, if we want to go there, call it the technology of the heart, um, which I've actually spoken about prior uh, to this a couple of years ago at Google. But when Michaela and I talked, I said, what, what can we really talk about right now um, that's going to be that's going to give some people um, maybe a direction or a comfort or just companionship in terms of thoughts that we're all sharing or feelings that we're all experiencing. And one of the things that I wanted to share with her is it was kind of, she wasn't aware that I was working on this other project, but in my life, I have definitely survived a lot of trauma. Um, I was hit by a drunk driver when I was 22 and that moment really catapulted me on the path of just choosing differently um, and choosing choosing my health over everything else because I knew that my health was all I had. If I didn't have my health, it didn't matter if I had wealth because I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. Um, and so from that very young age at a very vulnerable time in my life, when I was 22 and told, uh, we're not sure if you're going to walk again. I took a vow back then that I would never, ever take my, my mobility or my health for granted. And literally, I, Michaela called me just about an hour and a half ago. And I said, Michaela, I'm glad you got me because I'm on my bike right now. And I'm taking a bike ride. And then I promised to shower before this thing. Um, <laughs> because I... I have a huge amount of titanium in my leg that holds me together and, and gives me mobility every day. And I sat out of life in terms of being able to participate in it physically for, um, I mean, fully unaided for almost a year. I was, I was mobilized. I could be in a wheelchair and graduated from wheelchair to crutches to a cane. But really that year fundamentally altered me. And then subsequently over the last couple of years, there's been a whole lot of other series of deep, deep losses and challenges that gave rise to the hope experiment. And this is a book that I'm working on. And um, I don't know if it's a movement. I don't want to claim anything other than it's, it's 25 experiments that are based on the five aspects of post-traumatic growth. And what I thought we could talk about tonight is the one aspect, which is to see new possibilities. Because when Michaela had asked me if I would speak and she was going to ask me to talk a little bit more about Booksby, I wanted her to let her know that the only reason that Booksby exists is because in the midst of, of a divorce I was going through when my daughter was barely three years old, um, probably one of the worst years of my life when I was on my knees with you know grit in my shins and um, really kind of waking up every day with so much anxiety and fear about the future and about the unknown um, that this idea for Booksby actually fell into my lap like a star that came through in the darkness. And I started to realize through the last couple years as I have gone through the divorce and, and went through a lot of death um, with very close friends, a lot of whom were women with breast cancer, one of whom was a child that we buried on her third birthday, my best friend's daughter, um, only child. I have lost so much recently. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight is how do we collectively deal with the fear and the grief that is just pervasive right now. And I honestly feel that after having lost so much in such a concentrated period, and I'm not laughing in jest, it was, it, 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 I feel like I had a, a, a pipe cleaner that was like a steel wool that kind of went through my whole system and rebooted me and nothing has been the same since. So I'm, I'm going to pause because that was a lot, <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of give context to the why and the direction that we're taking tonight. Thank you, Holly, so much. I, 
you know, um, so you've, you've said a lot there in terms that I don't want anybody to miss because there are, um, there's so much to unpack just around, as you have called it, post-traumatic growth, right? Mm -hmm. We hear, of course, a lot about post-traumatic stress syndrome, all the things that are about what is depleting. What are the events that take away, that cause a ripple effect into one's life that is never anything positive? When you hear about PTSD, there isn't an upside. There is not a bright light, right? It is just about how does that person manage? So when you and I first talked about post-traumatic growth, I thought to myself, besides that, of course, that feels more hopeful, no uh, accident there with the HOPE experiment, which we'll get to, but I think that we can all agree on this uh, amidst uh, COVID that um, there is no way, unless somebody absolutely is determined not to, that they won't, to each of us around the world, won't grow from this if we choose to say, this is where we are. You know, this is that faceless control freak of a virus that, that has a hold of us, or does it? Because in post-traumatic growth, the hold really isn't on the negative. It is just what that was that leads us to the growth and the positive. So why don't you take one of the things, I mean, and probably everybody on the Zoom conferences stopped at hit by a drunk driver, and then it goes, you're like, oh my gosh. Okay, you got the credentials, we, we got that. <laughs> Use one of those um, experiences when the growth is what you started to really focus on in milling, if you will, that pearl, that, you, that, that grit. What, what did that feel like? What were those intentions? Um, I think it, it, it began, not to belabor the conversation of the drunk driver, but uh, at that time when I got hit, the doctors, my, my femur was in so many pieces that they literally told me they weren't sure I was gonna walk again. And my hip and, and um, pelvis were also uh, fractured. And they said, if you don't lay in bed for seven weeks, literally in bed and don't do anything. Um, which is really hard to do when you're 22, um, that I might not be able to ever have children. <laughs> I was like, what? And they said, if you don't have this heal properly, we're going to have to re-break your hip. And I've not even said these words and I'm making the connection right this second, that collectively what we are being asked to do and the choice we have right now is to handle the pain like a warrior and if we don't and if we don't really use it to seed the growth we are going to be broken again i can tell you that because i was um i actually broke my femur again that same summer <laughs> and the doctor said he's he was scared of me and i said i'm scared of myself um so just coming and i this is such a like heavy conversation space and i want to bring some levity into it too because part of getting through this, you know, these times, you kind of develop a little bit of gallows humor. Um, my friend Scott Foreman is, is on the call from Cultivator Labs and we just shared kind of a funny thing that COVID brought up. I literally just had a sty in my eye. I accidentally put colloidal silver plus that had, literally had oregano oil in it on Friday night. I can't believe I still have vision in my eye. I thought I was going <laughs> blind. Um, so yeah, talk about like, <laughs> grit with a lot of swear words behind it. Um, just kind of getting back to the point, if we, if we don't heed this opportunity, it's going to, it's going to go again. It's going to give us the other chance again. And that's where I'm hearing these conversations all around me of when we go back, when we go back. And I can tell everyone, we're not going back. You never go back after you've had the trauma. What it does is it, it puts you forward. And part of what the lesson and the, the challenge that I had in being alone in, in those moments, uh, now there's, a million, there's billions of people that are going through it collectively. So I'm like, wow, I'm not alone in my trauma anymore. 
um, in this new one. But what I learned is, and this, Michaela, is something that you had mentioned earlier today that we might talk about next, and that was I, I had to surrender. And I had to let go of trying to control the situation. And that was really the beginning of what I understood uh, true like faith was, is literally letting go and saying, I cannot, I can't handle this anymore. And I don't know what's out there, but something mightier than myself better deal with it because I'm delegating this to the universe. I am, it's not on my list anymore because I cannot do it by myself. And I think that's what I learned going through my divorce. And I literally was on my bed one day, like prone, like, you know, a drama queen with my hands in the air and flinging myself into the sunshine. It was a Southern facing window and just literally saying like, I can't handle any more of this, you know? And we've all probably had this. I mean, hopefully we've all had a chance to cry and scream and howl as we do every night here. Um, but what I learned is, is to, as scary as it is, to literally let go. And the Tom Petty song comes to me. I was thinking about it on my, my bike ride today. That song, Free Falling. He's, I'm free and I'm free falling. And I, I feel that that is where we're caught right now, collectively, around the world. We are free and we're free falling. And what we're free of is we're free of a whole lot of old patterns and ways that were not aligned and we're not really bringing us into our highest potential as collectively, as, as humans, as spirits and bodies, however you want to believe. But that is so bizarre that I would think tonight about the doctor telling me that if you don't listen to me and you screw this up, we're going to have to break you again. And life gave me lots of opportunities to break my heart open again and again and again. And I'll, I'll get there later, but I'm going to pause because <laughs> we have a lot to discuss, I think. Yep. Okay. So let's um, fast forward through um, several other painful hurdles that you have talked about, not the least of which is the death of your best friend's three-year-old which I think has even perhaps been more poignant than being hit by the drunk driver in terms of that indelible mark that it left on you. And I can only imagine. Um, to the point where you are racing through traffic to get to the yoga class in San Francisco at a pretty amazing place. Because that is the place at which I think fair to say that you then even had a pivot in your mind about what you could concentrate on, even though you'd been already talking about surrender, you'd already understood about the intention of the grit that it took to move into more positive, meaningful, like what was that purpose instead of folding your tent, fair to say, but take us to that car ride to this amazing yoga class, please. Okay, so what Michaela is talking about is an article that I, I've written. I haven't published it yet, but it came out just, I had like one of these weird moments. And for all of you that are on the call that are creative or writers, when you don't write for a little while, um, I end up with what I call like a writing seizure. And it happened two Saturday nights ago where I was like, oh, I got to just open up my laptop. And this whole article came out. And what it was, it, it's called... I don't know, the title is still working in my mind, but um, COVID courage. And I ended up going to Grace Cathedral. It was my last memory of a normal kind of pre-COVID day in San Francisco. And I ended up going to the Grace Cathedral yoga class on a Tuesday night, and I'd never been there. I'm sure many people on the call have been there. Um, I was busy, you know, busy being busy and missing, missing the opportunity. And going into 2020, I, I set the intention that I was so ready to grow through great love and great joy. And those were my code words for I'm ready to thrive because I'm a professional survivor. I don't need any more opportunities to survive. Little did I know what was about to happen within like literally a couple weeks. And um, 
And so I wanted, I wanted the permission to thrive. And so I literally was like, hmm, I haven't been exactly that graceful in my prior traumas. I took on everyone else's pain. Not a good thing to do. I thought I needed to suffer um, as everyone else was suffering versus watching and bearing witness from, from here, from my heart, which is compassion versus having empathy and sympathy, which actually drains you and makes you sick. Um, and so when I went to Grace Cathedral, I have to laugh because normally, as I would say, I would be jamming to some songs and trying to get there really fast, you know, normally yoga. And I was like, Holly, give yourself an extra half an hour to get there because you have to find parking in Knob Hill. And I gave myself permission to slow down. And I also just, I just trusted, you know what? I'm supposed to go there tonight and I'm gonna trust that parking is gonna happen. And I pull around and you guys all laugh, right? You, you make that circle to kind of turn around and um, you pass the Mark Hopkins and all of a sudden there's this parking spot, literally right in front of Grace Cathedral, like free parking, I couldn't believe it. And I open up the car door, there's a penny at my feet, you know, everything was a sign. But the idea was I, I wanted to go in and, and literally be in a, bu a building that embodied grace because that's what I wanted this year to be because I thought I'm ready, to, I'm ready to thrive. And thriving to me is grace for myself personally because um, I, I was, I've been in survival mode for so long. And I thought, man, 2020, the new decade, I'm ready to go. Um, and what I realized in this, this meeting, I, I had never been to the, the classes and all the pews had been moved for a film that had, been ta had taken place there that day. So it was really rare to have the yoga in no pews. And there were literally hundreds of people. I think there was 500 people that showed up that night. And the Dean had introduced the theme for the evening's class, which was developing spiritual courage. And I was like, holy cow. Wow. Did he just say that? And I thought, I wonder how that came up. Having no idea. And he had no idea that he was planting the seed for everyone to kind of pivot in what they thought this year was going to be. Because I'm back at this, the ground zero of, okay, wow, I've been here before. This is really uncomfortable. How do I sit with this discomfort and try to breathe through it and try to surrender and try my best to really trust that we are free falling and there is some net, some net, I don't know what it's going to be, that's going to catch us, but I think it's only going to be woven through our own intentions of where we want to go through all this, you know? And I, I get tears in my eyes when I think about Little Avery, but the whole idea behind post-traumatic growth, I had never stumbled upon it until I read Sheryl Sandberg's book, um, Option B. And she mentions post-traumatic growth after her husband had passed and I never heard it. I was like, well, I'm definitely familiar with post-traumatic stress. Um, and I thought, holy hell, this is what I witnessed with my best friend, who is like a soul sister to me, who actually lived with me in Colorado when I got hit by the drunk driver. So we go back a long way. She's a Pennsylvania sister like me. And I was watching her. We had gone through all the diagnoses and we knew that Avery had only a few weeks to live. And she asked me to bring my daughter down because she wanted me to take Avery to the beach with my daughter. This is gonna be killing me, but she wanted me to tell Avery that it was okay to die. And so I was asked to kill everyone's hope in that moment. And I haven't written about it yet. It's going to be part of the book. But that same weekend with my thriving five-year-old daughter who's feeding little Avery goldfish crackers and Avery's going more, more, more. While she's growing as a two and a half year old, um, she's growing, her body's growing, but so is the brain tumor that is literally eating her alive. And her mother is doing cartwheels in the lawn. And I have it on video. And Avery is giggling. And I looked at my best friend and I said, you're the strongest woman in the world. And I 
And I think the pain that we're all seeing right now, if you can imagine a woman who's losing her only child, and that's Mother Earth, right? Right now, if you just want to make Avery out to that, you know, we can still do our cartwheels. If we can find the strength to do a cartwheel in the park when our child is dying, we can get through anything. And that is, that I realized looking back, I realized, wait a second, I, I think we're, I had the same opportunities, right? I was determined to walk again. I refused to believe that, the, that I wasn't gonna walk again. Um, and, and I did. And we have to, each of us individually, I think, you know, choose what is it that we're determined to become after this, right? And, and that's, that's the hope, right? We know there's something there if we really, if we really take it in, because that is the grit. That's what forms the pearl, right? And I guarantee you, everyone, if we do lean, lean into it, you'll we'll come out of this stronger than we've ever ever been and um and that's actually exciting to me to know to know and experience that collectively i don't know what it's going to look like i don't think any of us know what it's going to look like is the truth and i think the other part of this is if i can pull spiritual courage back in which means a, a very different thing to each person Right, we talked about that. As I said, I'm going to explore this with you because I can think of any number of friends if I said, what does spiritual courage mean to you? And I know I'd have 20 different answers, right? So if we think about that being, what, whatever that is that one surrenders to, says this is bigger than I am. I mean, I have a friend who would say, let go, let God. And I have a friend in DC that says, let go, let dog. And I have, I, I mean, it does, it, it, it really is. I mean, everybody chooses to get their courage and their, and spiritual to them, it could be a universal force. But when we talk about that as hope, right, that that's really what gives us hope is knowing that we aren't in charge, that we can of course, see how this will turn out over which we don't have control, but you're not suggesting really that we seed all of the creativity, ideas, and um, goodness that can come out of this. And I think we've already seen that in places around the world, the, uh, not just the heroics and, and the gratitude for our first responders and our healthcare workers, et cetera, but other models and ways of translating this. So fair to say that that's really where we come into the hope experiment, right? And those essays that will be the book that I'm convinced is way bigger than that, it's of course, it's its own brand. And what better time? I mean, I would, again, I would argue that in any time, a hope experiment is a good idea that everybody becomes a part of. And the more that people have a host, if you will, for guiding uh, a dialogue, an exercise, an experience, an experiment to utilize the things that are in their lives and in the lives of each person on this collective conscience salon, then the more enriching and interesting I think it is. So let's, let's focus on the hope experiment, Holly. What, what does that look like, do you think? Because I'm not sure that even you could tell us tonight exactly how it will all come to fruition and how it will grow and play out because you're, you are literally um, giving birth to and rise to something that is very, very powerful. And so, but, but what does the beginning look like? What is the start that everybody here on this Zoom call can take advantage of, and let me say, spoiler alert, um, with your permission, as soon as the salon is over, um, I'll send a link to the Forbes article, which, because I think it was great, and there's a lot there about Booksby, but um, also would like to send that 1300 word excerpt that you sent to me that nobody's seen yet, if yes, that's okay. 
Yes, you can. Can you just give me one second? Will I have a, a writer's never done with rewriting? Um, yep. I actually made a couple revisions today. So before we send it out, I just tweaked it a little bit more because um, I got some feedback and I'm always listening to, no you know, uh, feedback. But yeah, absolutely. We you it will not send to the 33 guests that we uh, have tonight, but all of you on the salon tonight, you will get to be the first to see this before it actually goes um, uh, to being published, whether on Medium or a few other um, options Holly has. So I think it'll be great. It, it's beautifully, beautifully done. So let's, let's go to the HOPE experiment. Let form that for us at this particular stage. So I, I, uh, the whole idea this came to, to being is uh, my daughter, when I was moving, talk about another like WTF moment. Um, our landlord had raised the rent. Um, twice in one year, there was no, you know, rent control in Marin County. And at that point I was, I, I was running my startup and there was no way I could continue with the stress of where we were in terms of our funding and just where we were in general and keep paying this exorbitant rent. So I sold half my stuff. I, um, put the rest in, in storage and then a very painful moment, but weirdly liberating. I gave like 400 books to the Mill Valley Library. Um, I had to part with some of my best friends, but um, you know, it was all this experiment for me and just kind of paring down and, and getting back to like essentialism. And at that time, um, I had to make a big decision. And the decision was, holy hell, it is so expensive here. How am I going to do this and raise my daughter and continue with the startup? And so I was like, Holly, be a mature adult about this, right? Cast your net wide. And so I cast my net wide and I said, all right, I could go, I could move up to Petaluma. And then I kind of started, I was like, that's the farthest right now that I'll consider so that I can still make the commute and allow her to come back to go to school here. And um, I ended up talking to a friend and this is all about kind of the hope experiment because this was drawing on um, my ability to kind of see new possibilities and also about um, I started writing again um, in my journal and you talked about like God or dog or you guys fill in the blank whatever works for you uh, you know uh, it, it, it doesn't matter I don't have any language around it I do write in my journal and I literally write letters to God and I'm like here's the deal God I need help here's the, the form of the help and here's how I'd like to help right? Here's how I help myself, but here's how I needed to show up. And I know it won't be, I don't know if it's going to be a stranger, but I have been doing this now for the last five years consistently. And I stopped my, my journal writing practice in the midst of my, my, my marriage. And, and, um, and when I got divorced, I started to write again in, in my journal. And I just thought I, I need to write to someone, um, or something. And this all goes back to the the drunk driver too, I, I knew there was something there that night, right? And I won't go to, into all this because we'll get back to the hope experiment. But um, this, this lesson that I'm trying to understand myself about kind of letting go and, and seeing what shows up. So there's, there's something that I encourage all of you to do right now in the smallest way. And that is whatever is the biggest holy shit moment that you're experiencing right now of like, holy shit, if this, then that, right? In terms of loss, right? We've all been doing it, right? It's like, holy shit, right? We have these secret moments. I am gonna challenge you all, give you the opportunity to kind of, this is the experiment, is to just kind of divest yourself of the worst case scenario. Because if the worst case scenario happens, are you still alive? Are you still breathing? Do you have clean running water? Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have one person in the world that you can call that loves you? Right? If you can answer yes, and do you have some food in your fridge? You probably have pickles. I mean, maybe, right? Or, or some butter. There's something there, right? You're going to survive, right? So if you take all of your holy shit moments and literally start unpacking them, you're going to get back to but I have clean water, I have a friend, I experience love in this world, I can look out and I experience the sunset and that's beautiful. So I still have beauty, I still have love, 
I still have clean water. I have a roof over my head. I'm still okay. And this is the exercise I have been doing almost all the time for like the last five years. And here's what happened. When I cast this net out and I wrote in my journal, dear God, I have a serious problem. They raised the rent again. Those you know what's and fill in the blank with my hand like this in the air. Um, my friend, I went and talked to a friend and I said, what would you do? Because I trusted his judgment. And he said, Holly, we have a guest cottage, you know, up on the mountain. Why don't you and Graceland just go up there? And he said, you can think about it. I'm like, no, I didn't get time to think about it because I had tears streaming down my cheeks. And I was like, oh my God, are you serious? And he's like, yeah. He's like, but you can take your time. Think about it. I'm like, I don't need to think about it. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. And thank you. And so I managed to get my daughter into a little cottage. We called it like the Goldilocks house. It was literally a tiny cottage. It didn't even have a kitchen. And I raised her there during her second grade. Um, and we, she had a little loft. It literally looked like Goldilocks. She was at the right time, at the right height in her life to like still stand up and have friends sleep in the loft. Um, I created my own kitchen out of a Breville toaster oven that's right here. And um, I was able to like jury rig a, a Burton induction oven so I can like actually, you know, boil water. And there was a little tiny fridge and a bar sink. And I was there in Mill Valley for a year. And you know what? I was just fine. And so I, that was one of my holy shit moments. And it was one of my moments of letting go and letting dog or God or star or Amadeus, like whoever it is, right? Come in and just let's see what happens. So when we get to that place, wherever you guys are at in your fears right now, whether they're silent or spoken, or whether you write in your journal or not, play with this, be playful. Because the fun thing about this, when you start these experiments, when you start to let go, you, things will start happening. You will start experiencing magic, which some people call miracles. But I am telling you, like, I never expected that in a million years. But because I was in such an authentic place of surrender, I literally just let go. There was nothing else I could do. And I was willing to walk away from this place. And I remember having my own heartbreak because I love Mount Tam. I am there all the time. I'm hiking. I have ra raised my daughter basically uh, in those woods. And, um, and there's just a real connection I have to this place physically and, and the headlands. And I was like, if I can't access them on a weekly basis as I do, as I've done for the last 15 years, like there is going to be a part of me that's gonna die. And I was like, did you get that guy? There's gonna be a part of me that dies. Like the best part of me is gonna die if I can't live near this mountain, right? So I just want you to know that. And you know, you can be playful and it doesn't always have to be serious, but it is amazing when you get quiet and you get still and you start paying attention, you're like, wow. Oh my gosh, I just got this email and someone's offering this. I don't even know this person. Was that in direct response to what I just wrote? And I can tell you the answer is absolutely, it is. And um, you know, there are invisible strings everywhere that are connecting us right now. And it's amazing. And when you start to kind of feel into that existence, that to me is the hope. That's the net that's gonna catch us, you know, as we go through this free fall. But I didn't even, I don't even have an experiment called the holy shit experiment, but I think I'm going to make one up now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now there's the holy shit podcast uh, <laughs> experiment and, and the hope experiment. Um, so I that's, guess. that's, you know, that's definitely part of it is, is uh, experiment, whatever the holy shit, you know? Right. Or maybe we can call it from holy shit to hope and back. <laughs> yeah, from holy shit to okay. hope. Um, listen, I want to make sure, Shelly, if you would let me know if um, anyone would like to ask Holly a question about this time, because we have 15 minutes, which is usually what we leave for our community to ask our guest speaker any questions, anything that um, she hasn't revealed that you want to ask her or something even deeper. Do we have any questions? We do not have any questions. Because everybody not is... Yet trying to figure out how to get out of, their, out of their own holy shit moment, I guess. We're all still <laughs> processing what's happened over the past 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a lot. And, and Holly, I, 
Um, and Shelly, when somebody raises their hand, please stop me. I don't want anybody to have to wait who has a question. But, you know, Holly, we um, have had the good fortune to really know each other more over Booksby. Thank you, Shonda Ballas. Um, and it is truly, I mean, totally inextricably linked here, right? Because you wouldn't have done Booksby had that not been related to the whole idea of not being able to sell your second novel and then, you know, saying, wait, it's great, great storyline, no problem, just don't know how to market it. And you're like, what? So you had to come up with your own system, and this happens to be, right, a software as a service model using AI to help the author, and, and it's not some linguistic translator that's going to write the book and disintermediate authors. It's thing something that will galvanize actually a pretty ossified industry so you want to just do a little thing on books i know you're very self-effacing when it comes to talking about this yeah. founding but it's it's a really important piece to me of that part that you gave birth to yeah so um so that would be that would fall under the category of which is category five there's no order for for these categories in terms of the post-traumatic growth index but that would fall under seeing new possibilities and again it is inextricably inextricably linked um it was another holy shit moment where in the midst of my divorce i'm realizing oh my God, there's going to be no spousal support. There's going to be pretty much no child support other than like a 50-50 in every way. And um, that was the moment that I literally was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because I also received the news that my, you know, that the publishing world was not going to accept my latest novel which I had spent two years rewriting. It, I had literally cut almost 45% of it. The book was upwards of 700 pages. And it's my, my last book, it's historical fiction called Damasina. It's about Rumi. And I had done tons of research. It just killed me, still kills me. And um, in the midst of that, I just thought to myself, what am I supposed to do? Like, aren't you supposed to follow your heart? Aren't you supposed to like, you know, engage your passions? Isn't that what I was told my whole life? And it wasn't adding up. And my first two books had been published traditionally. I started my own press. And after my daughter was born and in the midst of the divorce, I'm like, there's no way. I got a two and a half year old. I can't, I can't do all this myself. So I went quote unquote back to New York, right? Remember how I told you guys? You can't go back. There's no back. It doesn't exist anymore. And so I tried to go back. I tried to find a traditional agent for that book. And it went to some great people. And then it went to some editors. And the agents themselves were just like, we, you know, it was some great people. And they gave me nice words. But then they all came back and said, we don't know how to sell this. Maybe that's their other, their code word for this is terrible. But I don't believe that because I had tested it with like 37 test readers. So I was on like, talk about brokenhearted and just keeping this to myself because I thought, you know, Holly, you can walk today. You've got a healthy daughter. You live in Mill Valley. You can go ride your bike, bug up, right? Not a big deal. And secretly my dream was just dissolving in my hands, right? Just like sand going right through it. And I thought, holy hell, I have put my heart and soul into this. And the message in that book was about deep transformation and, um, and which I have to laugh, right? It was all about like love. And so in the midst of this, in the midst of my divorce, it was 2013. And that's when I had this thought of, wait a second, like, I'm not going to put another book into this system. Dog, God, whoever you are, whatever's up there. I'm not going to put any more of my gifts into this world until I can fix this crazy asinine system. And I had no background in technology other than teaching myself how to build websites. And um, I, through some wild connections and in, in wild conversation spaces that led back to my last editor, that led to a conversation that literally seeded Booksby. And um, I never thought in a million years I would be doing this. 
but all along I kept walking around going, there should be this thing, right? I would hold my hand out. There should be this thing. But like, if you want to find a book, you just, it's like Pandora. You go in and you say, here's what I loved, right? And then, you know, here's what I'm in the mood for right now. Because right now I could tell you on my profile, I, I you know, read Thomas Pynchon. Who wants to read Gravity's Rainbow right now? Nobody. <laughs> we want to laugh. We want something dumb fun. And we want to get through this, right? And um, however long it takes us, but like, don't make me think too much right now. I don't want any more cognitive load than I already have on a daily basis. Uh, that leads to styes and shingles and all kinds of things, right? Um, so that's when it started. And that's where, again, it was like, huh? And I got quiet and I was like, huh? What? What? I'm going to be making technology, right? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. And I used my writing to write a proposal to the National Science Foundation and propose the use of natural language processing in the way that Pandora had converted math or music into math. Why the heck couldn't we convert the letters into math? Because I believed that there was a resonance. There was a signature inside each one of these books that enabled me to have a connection with it. Right. So if you look at your, no pun intended, but like top shelf, right? All those books I had to give away, they were good friends, but you know what? They weren't my top shelf. I did keep those, those top shelf books with me. Some of them are in storage in Petaluma right now. Um, but the idea was there's a relationship I have. And can we understand the chemistry? And can we do that by kind of reverse engineering all that text to understand like the fingerprint? of this, which is the DNA of the book. And that's essentially what, what Booksby does. We look at the deep technology and, and resonance of these, these books to help them find their way in the world. Great story. Did you just freeze, Holly? Oh, you? Oh, no, I didn't freeze. <laughs> okay, all of a sudden your picture just stopped. Okay, so Shelly, any questions? No, but I did, you, uh, no, but I did want to let you know that you had some props from a fellow author about Damascena. And it's from Nancy Davis Coe, who's with us today. And it says, if you've never read Holly's work, I highly recommend Damascena as a starting point. Amazing book. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that would, yeah. That it's, it's really, Holly, it's been so wonderful to, to have you with us today. And I, I hope as what we have um, encouraged and found that um, our salon community then stays in touch with speakers. And what I love in kind of very TED-like fashion is that our speakers are also our community. So many people on this evening are also future speakers, which as I said at the very beginning speaks to the thoughtfulness and the diversity so that we take this opportunity, which for me is part of my own hope experiment and ours with Shelly at Mocha Plus and really learns, takes this time that we don't usually have to learn from, to, to digest, if you will, and, and really look at the ways in which we can be a part of things that previously either just were not touching us or um, on our radar, or we were too busy to notice that we're right in front of us. So I hope people um, not only read Damascena, but understand more about Booksby, and we're looking forward to the HOPE experiment. So I thank you so, so much for being with us. Thank you. There's, uh, there's a woman, An Anthea? Yeah, yeah Anthea. 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 Hello. Yes, she, she's asked a question that says, great story, so what's next? Yeah, I'm just saying, what's, your, what, what's next for you, Holly? I'm, I love your story. Love your story. Oh my God. Hopefully true love, a dog, uh, a yard, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, just really everything. We're, we just launched in February with Booksby, so we're, you know, I feel like even though I've been carrying this for many years, we're kind of at the beginning. Um, and then the hope experiment is kind of, I, you know, it's just something that started quietly. And now that I see all these opportunities in terms of how people can just hopefully be, add some levity or, or opportunities for them. It's not about optimism, but it's about giving yourself an opportunity to cultivate something that will help you get through it. And I know, Michaela, you did ask something, and I think I got sidetracked, but I will 
end with this, Anthias. Thank you for asking. I think the hope experiment is what's next, um, actually. But um, this very first aspect of post-traumatic growth is finding strength. And I think if, if everyone here has that opportunity to just focus on how do you build your strength? Because right now, if you can find strength in yourself, right, then you're going to have what is the antidote to all this, which is resilience. And I think that's what all of these horrible traumas that I've gone through, including the heartbreak of my last book, it gave me resilience, you know? And I'm, I'm kind of like, all right, universe, freaking pandemic, like, bring it. Like, I, I got this. And, um, and I'm not saying that I'm laughing every day, right? I am crying with you. I am crying with my daughter. I'm crying for the world. But I also know, like, I've been here. I, I know this hill. And I know how to breathe. And I know how to pace myself. And, and if I can offer comfort or humor <laughs> through all this dark and allow me to throw down some F-bombs and, you know, holy shit moments, um, I, I think there's going to be a way. And, and that's why I didn't want to hide anymore behind this thing that was happening on the side while I was still bringing Booksby into the world is because I'm a writer and stories heal. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to stay silent anymore with this. I want to give it away, you know? There's something I have to say, and Anthea, thank you for asking that because it just hit me that the three authors that we've uh, had the good fortune to be our guest speaker, Nancy Davis Coe with the Thank You Project, and Thay with Magic in the Mundane, and now the Hope Experiment, think about how inextricably linked those are yeah. in terms of the emerging opportunities that we have <clears throat> pay attention if we listen and we're willing to do the work that isn't really hard if we're trying to, if we're present. Yeah. So that might be a really, I want to moderate that panel. Okay. <laughs> sounds, and, sounds fun. and we have others um, coming up that I won't uh, talk about that are also authors and be very exciting to add to that. So thank you. And for everybody in the community, thank you so much once again for joining.